so. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. Um, before we get started, I know it's a little hard for everybody to see the screens, so we might want to do a little scrunching. I don't know if that's possible. Can everybody see the screens? Is everybody feel good? Yes. Okay. So, welcome to the School of Architecture, Planning, and Preservation. My name is Renee Eisenbach. I'm a professor of architecture here at the school. And I am the curator of the Kaibel Gallery. And it's my pleasure to welcome everybody here today and to um, invite everybody not only to this lecture, but to the opening of this really special ex exhibition. So for our guests, you are sitting in our great space. This is the heart of our school. It's the way that our community um, both share space. It's our public realm. It's our workspace. It's our celebratory space. It's our event space. It's our space for dialogue, and it's our space for conversation. Um, it, everything around us moves so that we can adjust things to our needs. There's another layer right now in the space which I think is particularly relevant. Two years ago, we celebrated um, the anniversary of our school, the 50th anniversary. And for that anniversary, we did a number of things. Two of them are still visible. If you look around at the columns, you will see that there are columns that have numbers on the top, years. And those are um, the stories of our alums. Every the year on the top is the year people graduated. And you can see what our alums have accomplished. The students who sat in this space, who worked here, and what they're now doing in the world. Um, the ones without numbers are those of us who are faculty who still have the pleasure to continue to work with those students uh, as they prepare themselves to do work in the world. Above us, there are a series of banners. Those banners came from a year-long conversation of our community where we sought to define what we thought of as our possible future. What were the important questions for us as a school to be considering? And the faculty have been working very hard on a strategic plan led by Dean Leinbaum that um, helps to advance those and expand on those um, questions and aspirations. One of my favorite ones, um, you'll see there's a lot of them are about social justice, about um, dealing with a limited um, earth, limited resources. But one of my favorite ones is not a question at all. It's, I will trust my future self to figure it out. And I think that is probably um, one of the most valuable things that we um, learn from one another, and we learn from our students, and we see when we look also at the accomplishments of our alums. It was this exhibit that we have around us that actually sparked the exhibit and the work we're here to celebrate today. Um, through that work, I had the opportunity to meet Larissa, and Larissa said, hey, let's do an exhibit about this memorial. This is really important, and I think there's a lot that we can share about it. I'm really glad, Marissa, that you raised that, and it's a pleasure to be here today. And so for our students, I think it's also seeing these things around us, these columns, um, to know that Larissa is one, was one of you, that she sat in this space, and she has now um, worked for many years, and we'll see here her speak. <coughs> So the exhibit that you will see in the conversation that we're hoping um, to have as a result of this exhibit, on one hand, is about an event that was suppressed for many years. Um, the tragic uh, man-made famine in which over 3.9 million people in the Ukraine um, died of starvation, plus probably many more. And that, um, that was not acknowledged for many, many years. Um, and when it finally was, 
One of the things that happened was that a memorial was created in Washington, D.C., and Larissa will tell us about that story. The other part of the exhibit is what the question that is raised by this memorial and the story is the larger questions um, about how we commemorate world loss, the role of memorials play in our society, excuse me, the role memorials play in our society, the significance of setting aside space in Washington, D.C., and the tragic impact that manipulating the truth can have. These are questions that are extremely relevant today and are not just relevant to this particular uh, event. And so in the exhibit, we have both the story of the memorial and we also have the places to consider these, the relevance of these larger questions um, for us all. So, it's my pleasure to introduce Larissa, but before I do, I'd like to recognize um, a number of people who are with us today. So, and the people who made it possible for both this event and the exhibit. So, I'd first of all like to recognize our school, um, the University of Maryland School of Architecture, Planning, Preservation, and Real Estate Development for supporting this exhibit and this event. Um, the Embassy of Ukraine in the United States uh, for your support in many ways and also for, in particular, for the reception today. The University of Maryland Department of History, Forrester Construction, Hartman Cox Architects, the Kaibel Foundation, the Nathan and Jeanette Miller Center for Historical Studies, and also a sponsor of the reception of the Ukrainian Catholic National um, Shrine Library. Larissa gave me a hand. If you see the red, it's because I can't quite get the accent right on anything in Ukraine. So if I'm off, please forgive me. So I would like to welcome His Grace Boris Gujiak, um, the Archbishop of the Ukrainian Catholic Church in the United States, and President of the Ukrainian Catholic University, which he founded in Lviv, uh, Ukraine in 2002. And thank you for joining us today. And I'd also like to welcome his colleagues, um, bishops also of the Ukrainian Catholic Church. Thank you for joining us, and we welcome you um, to our home and also to this conversation. Um, one of the other important points of this exhibit is to show that sometimes the spark of an idea may come from one or two people. But as it extends, it involves lots and lots of people, and you'll see that in the exhibit, um, in the description of the, um, of the project. But I'd like to just take a moment now, there were many people who worked on the exhibit, I don't know who's in the room, but if you would be willing to stand up, they may still be in the gallery. Anybody here? Well, let's just give them a round of applause. Now um, to the main event. So Larissa will give a talk. After that, there'll be an opportunity for questions. We'll be joined by the ambassador of Ukraine, who will make a few remarks, and then we will all um, go to the gallery for the reception. So Larissa Carillas is a practicing architect who established the Carillas Studio in Washington, D.C. in 1991. Working on a variety of projects, she likes to call her firm a general practice, a phrase borrowed from legendary DC architect Clothiel Woodward Smith in response to the question, what kind of architecture do you do? Larissa Grillis received a Bachelor of Architecture degree, summa cum laude, from the University of Maryland, where she was also a recipient of the AIA School Medal, the Dean's Prize, and a Certificate of Merit from the Henry Adams Fund. After winning a Stewardson Traveling Fellowship, 
She completed the Master of Architecture program at Harvard University's Graduate School of Design. Larissa Grillis has taught at the Boston Architectural Center and the University of North Maryland. Please join me in welcoming her. starting in these very halls. This is a picture of me 40 years ago presenting my thesis project 30 feet away. <laughs> and this is my uh, class of 1980. My Ukrainian American worlds happily existed side by side. Never in a million years did I think that I would be involved in a project that would overlap the ethnic Ukrainian and the professional American sides of my life so meaningfully. On December 2nd, 2008, I attended the dedication ceremony on the site of a future Holodomor Memorial in Washington, D.C. An act of Congress signed by George Bush on October 13, 2006, authorized the government of Ukraine to, quote, establish a memorial to victims of the Ukrainian famine genocide of 1932-1933 on federal land in the District of Columbia. The budding Ukrainian democracy had caught the imagination of U.S. lawmakers in the afterglow of the 2005 Orange Revolution. <coughs> Viktor Yushchenko rightfully became president of Ukraine despite an attempt to poison him and to steal the election by pro-Russian supporters of Viktor Yanukovych. <coughs> Remember this guy, he will figure later the story. <laughs> 
The Ukrainian Congress Committee of America, spearheaded locally by Michael Saukiel and the Embassy of Ukraine, successfully lobbied Congress. Representative Sandra Levin from Michigan, pictured here, became the congressional sponsor of the law, of the bill. So under the Commemorative Works Act, a memorial sponsor, in this case the government of Ukraine, working with an agency sponsor, the National Park Service, has have seven years to get approval for a site, for a design, and to draw a building permit, which is conditioned on all funding being in place. Otherwise, reauthorization by Congress is required. By the time of the site dedication, two years had already passed. The site, located at the busy intersection of Massachusetts Avenue, North Capitol Street, and F Street Northwest, is in the vicinity of Union Station, the Post Office Museum, and the National Guard Museum. It is also in a nexus, as defined by the National Park Service, of memorials with the theme, in this case, the theme of man's inhumanity to man. In the vicinity is the Victims of Communism Memorial, and also the, the Japanese American Memorial to Patriotism, which ironically means internment during World War II. Standing there during the dedication, I began to wonder how one might actually mem memorialize the whole of the law. Three challenges struck me immediately. Resolving the geometry of the triangular lot, mitigating the uncomfortable proximity to a famine memorial of the Dubliner restaurant in the Irish Times pub, and more philosophically and theoretically, how would one actually convey the idea of a deliberate famine in built form? A year later, the Ukrainian Ministry of Culture and Tourism announced an international blitz competition, blitz meaning five weeks long, for the design of the memorial. As a Ukrainian American architect, with this, in project, with this important project happening in my backyard, I felt duty bound to participate. In the late 1980s, the commission, I first heard about the whole of from an eighth grade Ukrainian school teacher, Mrs. Vavada Dibet. She's standing uh, in the back, uh, directly above my head. As a university student in Kyiv, she witnessed orphan children from the countryside called Bespetulni, or children without shelter, wandering the streets. She later testified for the Oral History Project of the U.S. Commission on the Ukraine Famine, established by Congress and led by James Mace. In the late 1980s, the Commission collected hundreds of eyewitness accounts of the famine in three volumes. Some accounts were recorded anonymously for fear of repercussions against family members still living in Ukraine. You see, the subject of the whole demand was utterly and completely denied by the Soviet government, a position held even now by its successor, the Russian Federation. James Mace turned out to be my history professor at Harvard University one summer before I attended the GSD. From him, I learned about the Soviet machine that was put into place by Stalin in Ukraine, first to impose unattainable grain quotas on Ukrainian farmers, and then, when those could not be met, to confiscate all foodstuffs. Special brigades searched for buried food with digging rods. At least four million Ukrainians died in what would become known as the Holodomor. Holodomor in Ukrainian is derived from two words, holod, meaning hunger, and morete, meaning to kill. Simply put, it means to kill through hunger. The purpose of requisitioning grain was to sell it on foreign markets to fuel Soviet industrialization. The purpose of starving the population was to break resistance to collectivization. 
The famine in the countryside, in conjunction with mass repressions and executions of Ukrainian intelligentsia in the cities, quashed any aspirations for independence in Ukraine for many decades to come. The veil of secrecy about the whole of the model was torn off when Ukraine achieved independence in 1991. Memorials in to its victims immediately appeared in every community affected by the famine, usually taking the form of simple crosses. Bells, candles, and millstones were sometimes incorporated into symbolism. In 1993, the first memorial in Kiev was built in Mikhailovsky Square using some abstract concepts. This was followed in 2008 by the large Nas National Holodomor Memorial Complex built on the banks of the Dnipro River. Almost every symbol was used uh, in this memorial. A candle, crosses, Cranes tangled up in barbed wire, millstones, and a statue of a starving little girl called Bitter Memory, evocative, evocative of one of the most famous photos taken during the whole of the model. In the United States, the first memorial took the form of a church in the Orthodox, Ukrainian Orthodox Cemetery in South Bonnebrook, New Jersey. Construction on it was started in the 1950s, only 20 years after the event. In Canada, the Edmonton the Holodomor Memorial features a twisted millstone. A parent and child trapped by circumstance is expressed in the Winnipeg Memorial. So I asked myself what form would a memorial take dedicate, dedicated to the victims of the secret famine deliberately created in Ukraine, but built in Washington, D.C., 80 years later, on a small triangular <coughs> site next to two restaurants. My answer to these questions was carried inside this carry-on size box built by my cabinet maker husband, Steve. <laughs> it was delivered to Kiev by Natalia Karboska three days before the competition deadline on Thanksgiving Day in 2009. She was attending a conference in Washington. Inside were a model built by Maryland alumnus Tom Eichbaum, which slid out on a tray to give access to the two folded presentation drawings prepared by another Maryland alumnus, Zach Schooley. I would like to read to you now the design statement which accompanied my submission. It started with the question, what do Americans actually know about Ukraine? Now you have to realize this was 10 years ago because now they know much, much more than they did 10 years ago. If they know anything, it is that Ukraine was the breadbasket of Europe, a fact that was taught in schools across America. For this reason, the main sculpture of this proposed Hold the Water Memorial represents a majestic field of wheat, 1.8 meters high and 9 meters long. The depiction of wheat is dynamic, it changes from high relief on the left edge to deep negative relief on the right, reflecting the transition from a record harvest to a horrible deficit. <coughs> As the wheat disappears, the term for the model 1932-1933 emerges out of the wall in greater relief. On a bent panel to the right of the sculpture, a short paragraph titled Famine Genocide in Ukraine explains the term hold the model and the basic facts of Stalin's genocide. The proposed material for the sculpture is bronze. The field of wheat sculpture sits on a raised gray granite planter wall approximately one half meters high. It is placed within arm's reach to encourage, a more more, to encourage a more personal connection to the memorial through touching and burnishing of the ground surfaces. The shape of the planter responds to the triangular geometry of the site. 
It is planted with a lot of variety and evergreen ground cover for year-round color. As befits the site, the primary orientation of the field of wheat sculpture is to the most important street, Massachusetts Avenue. The monument ensemble deliberately screens from view restaurants on F Street with outdoor seating. The scale of the trees works well with the triangular bank building. Their distinctive purple leaf color creates an appropriately somber backdrop. The unusual color and distinctive vertical shape of the trees stands out in contrast to the surrounding street trees and draws attention to the memorial from far away. The vertical and twisted branches of the trees create winter interest. The sculpture is placed towards the west end of the site as far as possible from the very busy intersection of North Capitol Street, Massachusetts Avenue, and F Street, achieving a more contemplative setting. The memorial does not interrupt the sight lines of Massachusetts Avenue, intentionally imparting a lower profile and restrained character to the memorial. Placing the memorial at the widest part of the site also allows for commemorative gatherings. For this purpose, the remaining area of the memorial outside of the planter is paved. The paving pat pattern is inspired by Ukrainian embroidery. The diagonal grid resolves the urban geometry of the site, but the sharp angular forms of the pattern create a subtle sense of unease. It is easy to picture one individual or a few, or an entire gathering of people at the memorial site. The image that comes to mind is a nighttime one with hundreds of candles placed on the planter wall and a gathering of people solemnly singing Vichnaya Pamyak, which means eternal memory, a Ukrainian funeral hymn. In Kyiv, 25 jurors voted for their top five choices from amongst 42 anonymous entries, including two international submissions. The, the jury did not rank their choices, stipulating instead that the final decision would be made, quote, by the American side. My project field of wheat was selected for the semifinalist pool along with these four others. Ritual cloth by Boris Lyuk, those are the uh, images on the bottom. Destroyed sphere by Alexander Gechenko. Shooting Hands by Ludmilla and Igor Grichanik, and Teardrops on a Wheat Field by Yuri and Lev Sinkevich. In January 2010, Viktor Yanukovych, <laughs> remember I told you not to forget, became president of Ukraine in a fair election. His election campaign, like that of our current president in the United States, by the way, was managed none other than by Paul Manafort, who is now sitting in jail for tax fraud for not reporting his income and helping, getting, helping to get in college elected. Whereas restoring Ukrainian history and knowledge about the whole of the model was a central theme of the former Yushchenko presidency, Yanukovych immediately removed the whole modeling from his official presidential website. This was seen as a tactic to appease the Russian Federation, even though Russia, per se, was not being blamed for Soviet wrongdoing. For a year and a half, the project languished. Meanwhile, only two and a half years of the seven-year clock was left for drawing a building permit on the project. Finally, in June 2011, the Embassy of Ukraine hired Harvard Cox Architects to advance the process. Mary Kay Lanzalata orchestrated a meeting of representatives of all the major review agencies and presented the five designs. A consensus emerged about the best two. At an October 2011 concept review meeting of the Commission of Fine Arts, Mary Kay, present, Mary Kay presented the Ukrainian Embassy's alternate choice shooting hands and preferred choice, field of wheat. The Commission of Fine Arts concurred with the embassy that the preferred <coughs> project was in fact a superior design. The opinion was also shared by the National Capital Planning Commission at their December meeting.
So what distinguishes the field of wheat from design from the others? For one, I think that it caters best to a Western audience which naturally associates wheat with bread basket Ukraine. Discouraged from using religious symbols for the competition rules, many Ukrainian designers resorted to symbols which without additional explanation might only be understood by a Ukrainian audience. Secondly, my design was enriched by a very site-specific approach which I attribute to my architectural training. Conceiving of the sculpture and site together to resolve the complex geometry of the site and to mitigate uncomfortable use proximities made the design stand out. Integral to my design was the creation of a gathering space in contrast to most other submissions which placed an object sculpture at the center of the site. The field of wheat sculpture is hard to imagine anywhere else. The bend in the wall anchoring the sculpture to the site is very specific to the angle of Massachusetts Avenue. I consciously strove for restraint in my design, that is, for horizontality instead of verticality, and I strove for abstraction in contrast to uh, other submissions which sometimes had drastic starving human forms in them. What carried the day, however, I think, was the communicative power of the field of wheat sculpture. The inherent beauty of the wheat belies the gruesome way in which it was weaponized to start the farms who produced it. The relentless movement of wheat from positive to negative across 30 feet captures the slow and deliberate nature of the whole of the model. The sculpture is at once representational and abstract. Only after my project was finally selected could I take an active role as a design architect and sculptor, working closely with Hartman Cox Architects, the architect of record, in subsequent review processes and design modifications which lasted over two years. Now every designer at this point fears that their brainchild will be ruined and watered down as a result of redesign by committee. In all honesty, I do believe that the project became much stronger. What is important to understand is that commentary, and sometimes contradictory commentary, from different agencies, should carefully be considered without compromising the essence of the concept. Obtaining a successful result in navigating the review process is not simply a matter of checking off boxes and incorporating <coughs> all suggestions made. It requires an open mind as well as a judicious attitude. The process of reviews, adjustments, re-reviews, and eventual approval is well documented in the gallery. Certain elements in the design, for example, were never even considered in the original such as stormwater control and provision of site furniture, including a bench, a wayside station, and skateboard deterrence. This is a big issue in Washington. Some items were in continuous flux throughout the view, review process, like the amount of paving, type of paving in different areas, number of trees, type, types of trees, types of shrubbery. Often a change in one element caused changes in others until everything settled into its final form. The element that I would like to focus on was by far the most highly scrutinized one. This was the south face of the sculpture wall. Initially, I simply thought of it as the plain bronze verso side of the sculpture and gave it very little consideration. I viewed it as a neutral backdrop for plantings on F Street. During concert review, the Commission of Fine Arts commented, quote, that a resolution of the F Street exposure of the wall was needed. <laughs> Likewise, the National Capital Planning Commission commented that, quote, the proximity and blankness of the wall could neg negatively affect the pedestrian experience on F Street. So, immediately after that review, I started to pursue the idea of expressing the intentional closing of Ukrainian borders during the famine by depicting barbed wire on the wall. At first I proposed real barbed wire made of bronze, spanning bronze posts in the void of the sculpture. 
During reviews with interagency staffs, this idea was rejected for reasons of safety and practicality. Simple textured stone panels framed in bronze were proposed instead. At another interagency staff meeting, the treatment of the south wall was still found inadequate. At this point, I proposed barbed wire etched into the stone panels and studied patterns at various scales. In another smaller staff review in June, the idea of depicting barbed wire at all was finally deemed too drastic a symbol. Luckily, between April and June of 2012, the National Park Service had concurrently sent the project out for public scoping. A comment by Richard Houghton of the Committee of 100 on the Federal City led to the final resolution of the ball. In his letter to the Park Service, he suggested that, quote, perhaps the South Face could even incorporate elements of the rich Ukrainian visual heritage. In that kind of light bulb, light bulb going off in your head way, I immediately thought of repurposing the paving pattern originally proposed for the plaza. That pattern is a simplified version of a Ukrainian textile design created in 1933, the year of the Holodomor, by Vasyl Kachevsky, a prominent cave and architect. The use of this pattern seemed very meaningful to me as a symbol of a parallel attack conducted by Soviet authorities on Ukrainian culture. And in final tweaking, during the production of construction documents, I asked Hartman Cox to rotate the design 90 degrees so that the long acute triangles in the pattern were horizontal and in a very, and in a very subtle way evocative of barbed wire. <laughs> Hartman Cox submitted permit drawings to the Park Service in July 2013. Commission of Fine Arts staff signed off on compliance with the drawings with earlier commission approvals. Government of Ukraine demonstrated that all construction funds were in place in a bank account, so that finally, on October 1st, 2013, 10 days before the seven-year law to establish the memorial was to expire, and two days before a federal government shutdown, <laughs> the National Park Service issued a building permit for the construction of the memorial. A collective sigh of relief could be heard in the Ukrainian American community as there was growing concern that the law might not be reauthorized by Congress as U.S. foreign policy in the Obama administration had shifted to a reset of Russia. And now to the sculpture. At the outset, I would like to underscore that collaborating with highly skilled craftsmen can reap results far beyond expectations. One expectation that I had during the competition phase was that should my project be selected, I would have to find an artist to produce a smaller maquette of the sculpture, which would then be enlarged and cast in its intended size. I was somewhat fearful that my idea might get lost in translation by another artist. On my initial visit to Loran Bronze in Chester, Pennsylvania, Larry and Lawrence Welker, father and son, sculptors themselves suggested that the sculpture could be fabricated in a virtual way by photographing real wheat and manipulating it in a software program. This immediately seemed like the best approach as the artistry of the sculpture was not dependent on an interpretation of wheat itself but in, the, in its abstract positive to negative rendering. <coughs> I was tasked with bringing wheat to Loran to photograph. But because the Commission of Fine Arts did not get final design approval for the project until July 2012, all harvesting in the United States, starting in Texas and moving up through Kansas and other states had already happened, except for North Dakota. I made a few feeble phone calls to the North Dakota Wheat Growers Association, asking if they could send me some wheat, and they thought I was great. <laughs> so in another light bulb moment, I remembered that my mother had a relative with a 2,000 acre wheat farm in Canada. My mother called her cousin Mike Kaminsky, 
who lovingly harvested wheat for us the old-fashioned way, by hand. In October, my mother and I drove three days there and three days back to Beauvoisier, Manitoba, Canada, near Winnipeg, to my Uncle Mike's house to pick up four sheaves of wheat that he had dried and bundled. Luckily, United States agricultural regulations allowed only Canadian wheat to be brought into the United States. <laughs> Since funding to fabricate the sculpture was not yet in place, the sheaves, or cadavers as we call them, <laughs> languished for a year under the watchful protection of icons in my parents' bedroom. <laughs> With funding finally in place, in October 2013, the work of the Foundry began. Collaborating mainly with Lawrence Welk of the Sun, we discussed arranging the wheat. Lawrence glued the wheat to a panel, painted it white to facilitate the scanning. This is in the show as well. And photographed the panel in six inch squares, frontally and at a 45 degree angle. Then he stitched the squares together in a program made by 3D systems called TouchX, which required ever stronger power and memory since he didn't anticipate an unbelievable amount of data. Going into this process, we had unquestioned confidence in the sculptural concept. The concept was that wheat would transition from positive to negative, rendering across 30 feet. In the digital modeling program, the original three foot tall by seven and a half foot long scan of wheat would first be doubled in size to six feet by 15 feet, and then one would magically press a button to add the negative half of the sculpture to the right side of the positive half and the length would be increased to 30 feet. In theory, this made perfect sense, but in practice, it was a disaster. The full height, 12 inch wide pattern of the negatively rendered wheat, shown on the right in the slide, presented to an interagency delegation and embassy staff visiting the foundry in January 2014, was completely unrecognizable. It looked like Bryce Canyon from any oblique view. This obviously led to a major reassessment. The, sculpture, the concept of the sculpture was modified so that the wheat would transition from being, from being in high relief on the left to barely visible relief on the right. At the same time, the rendered wheat would cross into the negative space of the sculpture, an essential aspect to me in conveying the deliberateness of the famine and the loss of life. As the wheat disappeared, the little-known word hold the mod, legible at the car scale, would simultaneously emerge in ever greater relief. Many other detailing issues were studied about the sculpture, sculpture, all of which can be seen in the exhibit. There was serious consideration that the wheat should completely disappear, but I thought that this would just look like a mistake. In a way, the straight line defining the right edge of the negative space conveys the idea of disappearance in a sort of vertical flat line of sorts. How the bronze, how the bronze and stone materials <coughs> related to one another was also the subject of a great deal of attention. In the end, I decided to make the bronze sculpture, sculpture appear to drape over the stone surface. A three-quarter inch deep reveal exposes a thin bronze edge of the sculpture and allows for thermal expansion of the metal across the face of the stone. And the 12 inch thick stone bookends coming to a one inch point in a nod to the ubiquitous acute angle found throughout Washington, D.C., most famously at the East Wing, creates the impression that the stone is also a very thin plane. In 
Inserting three small mice into the wheat field, suggested by Larry Welker, the father, happened serendipitously, but added another layer of poignancy to the memorial. It was often reported that starving farmers would scan harvested fields for mouse activity as a signal of where some fallen wheat kernels might be found. <coughs> the process of fabricating the sculpture in the foundry was fascinating. Foam pattern positives were carved with a CNC machine. One problem that Lawrence encountered was that no amount of digital sharpening or foam density experimentation or finer CNC bits could produce the desired crisp wheat heads at the left side of the sculpture. In the end, he had to hand tool the wheat kernels directly into the foam patterns. The foam patterns, a few of which are in the show, were coated with graphite and pressed directly into the sand mold matrix, saving costs by eliminating the step of creating the intermediate positives. The decision to go with sand casting was made early on, not only because it was less expensive than lost wax casting, but because sections of the sculpture could be cast at full height, thereby minimizing the number of welds, and especially avoiding horizontal welds across the grain of the wheat. Here you can see sections being bolted to the internal stainless steel frame. Seventeen bronze castings created the wheat field. The width of each section depended on the maximum amount of bronze that could be poured. So the sections with less wheat relief were wider. The whole of the model letters and numbers were inserted and welded from behind, eliminating weld marks on the front altogether. Patinas were tested. And finally, on August 4th, 2015, many months after Forrester Construction had begun preparing the site, and only two months before the dedication ceremony was scheduled, the five-ton sculpture <coughs> traveled comfortably down I-95 on a flatbed truck, was craned off the truck, <coughs> and bolted into place. This was another major milestone and another opportunity to exhale. On November 7th, 2015, an overcast gray day, 5,000 Ukrainian Americans gathered in Columbus Circle in front of the University <coughs> to dedicate the <coughs> war on their guide. Marina Poroshenko, the first lady of Ukraine, was in attendance. Her husband, Petro Poroshenko, was elected president of Ukraine after the Maidan Revolution in 2013, during which well, my bad revolution. During which Viktor Yanukovych, I remember him, fled to Russia. I was very gratified on the day of the dedication to see so many people taking ownership of the memorial, feeling that it was in some way theirs. Many tributes were left at the memorial in honor of victims of the whole of the law. While I had conceived of the low wall as a place for tributes, I never anticipated, but really liked the fact that the candles and flowers were placed inside, on top of, and in between the letters and numbers. of the memorial since its dedication. The use of wheat as a symbol resonates universally. Its confiscation, after all, and ultimate act of cynicism on the part of Soviet authorities cost starvation in the breadbasket of Europe. For many people, that symbolism is enough. Fewer people understand the symbolism of disappearing wheat, 
In fact, some people read the sculpture from right to left, seeing a resurgence of post-Maidan Ukraine and the emergence of bountiful wheat. Fewer still understand the symbolism of the abstract void in the sculpture as representing the deliberate nature of the famine and tragic loss of human life. Nevertheless, almost everyone has found some meaning in the whole of the Mormon memorial, so I feel that it has met the most basic and important requirement of memorials. Thank you very much. Surgeon General of the United States of America, your present Dean of the School of Public Health, uh, Dr. Admiral, uh, your Admiral Boris Kutak. Your Boris Kutak. I'm oh, sorry, <laughs> Boris Lushnak. <laughs> Just checking if you were listening. <laughs> you were listening. The second reason uh, is I want to encourage all of you students. I spent most of my life in universities and uh, it's really, this is a special opportunity for you this evening to see what can happen through your hard work, through your creativity, through your God-given gifts. Uh, you're close to the political capital, not only of this nation, of the world, and you see somebody who presented her senior thesis just over here, uh, who has made a monument in this capital, which helps a whole nation here understand the suffering of a nation there, and helps that nation there deal with that suffering. And that's the third reason why I'm here. I'm here with four colleagues, bishops, who represent the global Ukrainian Catholic Church, one from Kiev, one from Ternopil, one serving in London, another in Buenos Aires. And we're reflecting on the future service of our church. And one thing that we're identifying as important is dealing with trauma. The bishops visited the Afro-American Museum, the Holocaust Museum, that afternoon they went to the Bible Museum, moving from sin, slavery, and trauma to freedom, healing, and salvation. There's movement here. This is what we see in this monument. And uh, this, this presentation, this fellowship with you, uh, learning, listening more about this monument, which we all know and we've prayed at, uh, is a way of us finding instruments, language, categories to help millions of people that we serve come out of the sinful, evil capacity of human beings to kill each other, to depart from slavery, to leave behind trauma so that we can be free, healed, and really saved. Thank you, Lewis. A little more to follow that. 
<laughs> but um, please welcome your questions, your comments. Hi, uh, Boris Vishnak, uh, not the Jack, uh, the <laughs> Dean of the School of Public Health here. And I just sort of want to put the public health angle on uh, this as well. In that, you know, hunger, malnutrition, the issue of how we look at the world and the importance of things for the human body is critical to our understanding of how we function as biological entities. And I think what you bring to the forefront is the tie-in of, you know, the terrible genocide, the terrible hold of the law, and yet put it in the frame of, of, of hope to some extent, that we can memorialize something like this, that we can change the world. Because at the same time as we look back to 1932-33, things are happening right now in the world that have within us already memorials, maybe not built, maybe not set up here. And I think that's a critical feature, that in the world of, of health, of public health, things are happening. Let's not forget, we've looked back in the past. My question to you, however, is not so much about your upbringing, right? The three of us are friends for many years. We're Ukrainian-Americans. We were taught to behave a certain way. But I also reflected earlier today that it was 1983. The three of us were in grad schools in, at Harvard in Boston. And we took a long night trip to show up here in Washington, 1983, for the 50th anniversary of the Hall of the Moment. Three young people, three graduate students, traveling together with some other friends of ours, and coming to Washington to protest to, in essence, march the streets, to stop in front of the Soviet embassy, to clench our fists, and to say the world needs to understand. My question to you, Marissa, is how much beyond the Ukrainianism does activism play a key role in the life of a designer, in the life of an architect? How much of this is activism in addition to the love for your parents' country? Well, to the extent that any human being is a, is a citizen of a country and is part of the world, you know, architects also engage in all sorts of activist efforts. And, you know, I think it's a, there was a time when architects thought they could change the world through architecture, I think that's a stretch. But to the extent that we can, you know, kind of influence things and make the world a little better place to live, I think that's that's one of our main goals. Yeah, she has a student here too. so much for your presentation. Um, I have a quick question for you. So, um, what do you hope that citizens who live under the authority of communist uh, government right now will uh, vision the world after seeing this uh, memorial? Well, my biggest fear in authoritarian countries and access to truthful information. I think this is a huge problem. It's not, it's affecting our country as well. Uh, and hopefully, in, when people see that other people also speak a real truth, that there will be strength in that. And there will be the power to, uh, you know, change repressive systems. It's really a, a, a fabulous, fabulous um, process project and, and a very moving piece of, of, of public art. And I commend you and everybody who worked with you on it. It's really marvelous. Um, and you know, the sort of way in which it explains a piece of history that a lot of Americans should know about that they probably don't, 
is extraordinary. It's, it's public location there. This is it's really well placed. I guess, you know, one, one has so many different discussions about walls today. Um, you know, in particular walls that separate cultures and separate countries and other sort of things. And the wall is a kind of iconographic thing. I mean, I think it probably started at one level, at least our consciousness with my own Vietnam Veterans Memorial Wall and things like that. Was, was the wall always something that was a priori part of the design, or was it the site response? I mean, if the site was someplace else, would there still have been a wall for you? Sort of interested. I mean, the wheat is, is certainly your explanation of that and the power of that as a kind of representation of the very specific events that happened. But I'm interested in thoughts about the wall as a kind of um, an element to convey meaning. The wall was very much inspired by site conditions. I just thought it was uh, very uncomfortable to have the Dubliner in the Irish Times Cafe next to Famine Memorial and people chugging beers and eating hamburgers next to this memorial to victims of famine. So uh, I think if this project were somewhere else, it may not be a wall at all. And in the case here, it sort of makes for good neighbors, you know. It's not just that the people coming to visit this memorial don't want to see the people at the double or it's vice versa. You know? It just makes everybody a little bit more comfortable. Uh, and somehow, uh, the, the whole idea of this, uh, I mean, I have to say I didn't have 20 concepts for what this could be. For some reason, uh, I immediately thought of wheat. I thought it was the perfect symbol. And then I did want to <coughs> somehow incorporate something abstract in sculpture. So the wheat, you know, so there's something there for everybody. Very representational wheat, but yet in this treatment, it tells a bigger story, which not everybody has to understand. It works on many levels. Marissa reminded me that uh, she and I saw each other off and on 43 years ago over in that corner of the building. And I want to pay tribute to the search, the utter lack of pretense, and the total engagement with this project that you've demonstrated. <coughs> we are so proud of you, and I am so proud to have known you when you were just out of high school. <laughs> Can you speak loudly? Yeah, um, so first of all, thank you so much for this presentation. Uh, I don't know about the majority of us, but I definitely did not know. Um, that much about this event. Um, and one thing I did want to ask is when you were designing, or when you were going through the different phases of your design, did you get any inspiration or did any other contestants' design kind of impact you in a way? Not really. <laughs> uh, I have to say that since this memorial was built, I've gotten very interested in memorials in which uh, there was a whole movement in Germany, negative space memorials. Germany that was struggling with, with its post-World War II, uh, well, its World War II history after World War II, they, they uh, did some very interesting experimentation with memorials that were non-representational and non-monumental, which uh, was the most popular form of memorialization, I would say, up to World War II. And as a matter of fact, it was popular in the Soviet Union all the way up until you know, the 90s. Just to add on to that, um, one of the things you'll see in the gallery, many pieces of paper, um, are these cards. And they ask you for reflections, questions, and additions. 
And that's specifically because we have three spaces which we're calling nooks, which ask the question, one, who's truth? How do we mark loss? And why DC? And so in those nooks, we have examples of memorials and monuments and ways of both ephemeral and permanent um, ways of marking spaces, the question of truth, thinking about uh, memorials that have been taken down lately, right? all the Confederate ones, the debates about that. Um, in part, that comes also from the fact that um, when this event was happening, there was a journalist, uh, Yara Jones, who wrote about what was actually happening, and his story was suppressed and denied um, by a New York Times reporter um, who won a Pulitzer Prize for his reporting. And so there's a film about to come out about that. So the question about who's truth, how do we mark loss, and why in DC? Why would we have a memorial to something that happens in another country in this, in this capital? How do, what does it say about our understanding of ourselves as a nation and a country and how that changes? And so I want to just say that those larger questions and your ideas about other things that could go in those um, on those on those monitors, other examples would be um, helpful and welcome. Yes. Larissa, uh, what is your reaction to the latest addition to the wall on the right hand side there? Uh, homeless, the collection of homeless people that spent that live there. I have absolutely no problem with that. I mean, I don't know where, oh, the question was about homeless people. I mean, where are they supposed to go? We're in an urban environment, and, um, you know, I feel like they deserve a place to, to spend a hard night. That's the only place, so be it. Our society should be dealing with this in some better way. It's not insurmountable. I think we're allocating resources in a in a warped way. We have time for one more question for the ambassador, please. Not so much a question, but just uh, a thank you for an amazing presentation and an amazing um, opportunity to hear the process. But I think it comes at such a wonderful time for our school because it's the perfect demonstration of the power of interdisciplinary work. I mean, this is about planning, it's about heritage and memory, it's about beautiful design, it's about real estate and property and the way one puts all of those together to make something that's so much better than the individual parts. And so thank you for demonstrating that to, to all of us here today. Yeah. Ukraine. I have two questions. The first one, um, during your presentation, you, you showed several memorials all over the world. I would like to know which one is the most impressive for you. And to clarify the question, um, what is uh, your opinion? Which way is the most appropriate when we're talking about the trauma? To use uh, so-called symbolic images or to use realistic images to, to express the trauma? And the second one is about the museum and memorial in Ukraine. I hope you know that uh, the, the second part of the memorial in Kiev is now under construction. If you're familiar with the project, I would like uh, to know your opinion about the project and all controversies around this project. Thank you. Well, I heard that you're, you're alluding to the construction of a museum uh, at, the, at the National Hold to Water Memorial Complex in Kiev. I am really not that familiar with it to comment on it, and I haven't even seen the museum <coughs> complex in Cambridge, which I am uh, very interested in doing. 
Uh, let's see. I think I think I have to say I think abstraction can say much more than than figurative uh, sculpture. Uh, you know, figurative sculpture is limiting. Uh, if you think about the Vietnam Memorial, which was a very abstract thing, after several years there was a lobby to get figurative soldiers standing near it, and it was a white soldier, and it was a black soldier, and, uh, I don't know, a third soldier, and then the women are like, well, what about the nurses, who also contributed to the effort? Uh, I think uh, if an abstract concept is strong enough, it has a lot more power. Thank you, Larissa. It was just an amazing talk, and it's been a pleasure to work with you. I'd like to introduce the, uh, His Excellency Volodymyr Yelchenko, the Ambassador of Ukraine to the United States. Um, welcome to the School of Architecture, Planning, and Preservation in Maryland. We're so grateful you could join us.
to define our own destiny on our own land. The difference is a global outrage. 87 years ago, the loss of millions of innocent lives was silenced. And obviously it was yet another crime of that regime. Decades later, a powerful civil information campaign successfully led to the elimination of the Communist Party from Ukraine's political life and raising awareness about the Holodomor at the international level, in particular in the United States. Spreading the truth is a tribute to victims. I was proud to become the very first Ukrainian official as Ukrainian ambassador to the United Nations to say the word Holodomor from the highest rostrum of the world, the rostrum of the UN General Assembly. It was back in 1997. International recognition of the Holodomor as genocide would be a justified new step forward. The time has come to call the crime by its name. Neither Ukrainians nor any other nation deserves to be wiped off from the map of the world. The Holodomor Genocide Memorial is the, in the heart of the US capital is a reminder that people must act collectively to ensure that the world will never allow such tragedies to happen again. Dear ladies and gentlemen, I would like to thank everyone who has put tremendous efforts to pass the long way from, uh, from an idea to its implementation. Let me express our special gratitude to the United States of America for the support and for allocation of a special place near the US Congress where the memorial is easily accessible to Americans and to all visitors of the US Capitol. I thank Hartman Cox Architects and Miss Mary Catherine Lenzi Lotta, who helped us with, with obtaining approvals and permits from the US federal agencies and who made available uh, sorry, who made invaluable contributions to this course. My deepest appreciation goes to all Ukrainian Americans for their great support of keeping memory about Holodomor genocide for all those years. Finally, I thank our friend and partner, architect Larissa Kurilas, who authorized this great project, designed and put her heart and soul into it. She even visited Canadian Winnipeg to bring a real wheat, which is, as she says, looks very similar to Ukrainian one, <laughs> as a sample for a layout for the foundry. Dear friends, November 7, of this year will mark the fifth anniversary of this masterpiece in DC. I would like to invite all of you to save this date, to visit the memorial and to join us at the ceremony. Taking this opportunity, I wish all of you success in all future life. Thank you so much. Thank you.